obviously that is that is um oh goodness do i need to click anything here got it no that is that is slides back to where i'm going beginning okay so the monarch life um, life cycle during the summer months is going to fall into the pattern that i'm talking about but for those of you that are familiar with monarchs, you know that the last generation, the one that we are experiencing right now, those caterpillars that are feeding, they are going to turn into what's referred to as the super generation or the Methuselah generation. So the story changes a little bit, actually a lot for them. So the life cycle, I'm going to start it with the adult monarch. When the adults emerge from their chrysalis, um, within the first 24 hours, they have finished forming their wings, their proboscis, they feed, and they begin courtship. An adult monarch is actually only going to live during our summer breeding season, somewhere between two to three weeks. They have the potential to live up to four weeks, but it's very rare that you ever have a monarch live that long, or any butterfly for that matter. All of our butterflies have a two to three week window for them to be reproductive. So let's jump to there. I, I, I'm hoping you can see my pointer I'm trying to I'm going to use it as a, um, you know, like a laser pointer if, if it's following the screen. I don't know. All right. So the monarch, once it lays an egg, um, and let me back up a tad. A female monarch is emerging from her chrysalis with a contingent of about 400 eggs. At the point that she mates, all of them can be fertilized by one mating. However, nature has designed it that she may mate multiple times generally every day if there's someone to court her. And each time that she mates, the eggs that are laid after that mating now have a new genetic blueprint. They have a different parental lineage. And nature's design is so that you don't have substantial inbreeding by siblings constantly mating with full, full blood siblings. So once the female lays her egg, um, the clock for it begins to tick. It's going to hatch from that egg in somewhere between the next three to five days. The difference in time has everything to do with the temperature. The warmer it is, the faster the process. Their, their whole metabolism is slowed down when the weather is cooler. So those of you that have monarchs still laying eggs in your yard right now, it wouldn't be unusual for them not to hatch for maybe seven to 10 days because the cooler temperatures slow the whole process. Once that egg hatches, the um, small caterpillar emerges, it eats its egg case, and then begins eating the milkweed leaves. Monarchs must eat milkweed. There's over 100 varieties in the world, and I'm gonna talk about that in a couple of slides, but if it's not on milkweed, that caterpillar will choose to starve. They taste with their feet, they walk on the leaf, they're looking for a chemical compatibility. And if it is not there, they're going to um, turn their nose up and walk until they find what is the right taste for them or have died trying. So that caterpillar was going to eat again, temperature driven somewhere between seven to as maybe as much as 17 days. Um, it will molt and shed its skin a total of five times. And I'm gonna show you that on the next slide. At the fifth shed, the interior layer of skin, that sixth layer is what encases it. They are not creating a cocoon. There is no such thing as a butterfly cocoon. It's okay to call it a pupa or a chrysalis. And once that butterfly has encased itself in that chrysalis, eight to maybe as much as 20 days now with the weather changing um, will be the development of that butterfly and out it will come. And within the first 24 hours, it is going to either be reproductive or migratory, but it is never both. They emerge with a different chemical, a different biological and behavioral difference depending on the season and how they are triggered to develop. So that's the life cycle of the monarch. Here's a quick photo that says once the egg is laid, as it hatches, you have those five instars, and after each se sequence of growth, it's going to shed its skin. So each growth cycle is called an instar, and each shed in between is referred to as a molt. 
but it's amazing from that to that in um, a period of a, somewhere between seven to 14 days time. The rapid rate of growth and the volume of milkweed that they consume is enormous. All right, once that caterpillar's finished feeding, we went to that chrysalis phase. The, when they first form their chrysalis, they're this beautiful jade green with this gold, which unfortunately in this photo does not look as gold as it appears on them naturally. And as their development into a butterfly, um, that process evolves, this green encasement is getting thinner and clearer and uh, you can begin to see through it. And a lot of people will refer to their chrysalis turning dark, which is not what is happening at all. The chrysalis is getting clear like a cuticle and the darkness that you're seeing is actually this is the, um, the abdomen of the butterfly, the wing pattern, the head is down here, it pushes itself open and, and then starts that process of wing expansion and proboscis forming. Okay, so when your monarch emerges, we have either male or female. And the identifying difference is this. If they're side by side, it's easy to see that their, their vein structure is different. The females have a thicker vein structure than the males have. But if you don't have two of them next to each other, what's thick, what's thin? Sort of like, you know, who's fat, who's skinny? Don't really know. So the true difference is to say that the males have these two spots on their lower hind wing that the female does not have. And it's much easier to see when their wings are open. There is a, you can see it from the underside, but it's not nearly as clear as when you're seeing it with the wings opened. Okay, so let's talk about monarch migration now that you understand monarch behavior. Um, each fall, millions of monarchs are leaving the United States and Canada, and they're heading to the uh, mountains of central Mexico. Um, they're doing that because they are a tropical species that found their way into the North American continent probably millions of years ago. But their origin being tropical, unlike our native butterflies that have a chemical in their body fluids that, like an antifreeze, if you will, um, that keeps them from freezing or being killed off by, by frost and freeze, monarchs don't have that. So the only way that they can survive in North America is to um, make this migration. It's one of the wonders of the world. There's the concerns about this migration is that their habitat is threatened by a number of things. It's the loss of the overwintering grounds in Mexico. And there's also a pretty substantial loss of the breeding areas in the United States. And by breeding areas, we're talking about those places that milkweed used to be and isn't any longer. So on this map, this is a shaded map that says there is monarch distribution worldwide. Um, Again, we talked about the monarchs arriving in North America from migratory ancestors. And um, we know that as much as 20,000 years ago, the population that was occupying the Southern part of the US began moving North um, and expanding their range. And that range changed because as milkweed showed itself further North into North America, then the monarchs had a broader place to be. But right now there are monarchs in places, uh, North, Central and South America. They're in North Africa. They're in Hawaii in the South Pacific, uh, Australia New and um, New Zealand, as well as Spain and Portugal. So when people talk about monarchs and the threat of their demise, that's not really what's going on. The threat is the North American migration. If we lose that phenomena, none of these other areas migrate and, um, and they, they don't need to. They're in areas that are not going to drop into temperatures that is going to uh, kill off the population. Okay, so why do monarchs migrate? Well, we've kind of just talked about that. They need to leave because they can't tolerate our winter. Why do they go all the way to Mexico? where they're, I mean, they simply could go south. Maybe they could go down to Miami. Maybe they could go down to Southern Texas. It's the microclimate that the forests in Mexico offer them. It's cold. It doesn't 
and shouldn't. It, do, it sometimes will have a, a freak storm, but in those mountainous regions of Mexico, they, um, the microclimate that they're in hovers around 45 degrees. It's hydrated because they're so high up in the cloud strata. So I'm gonna go to the next slide and show you some of these things. So why do they migrate? We know. Where do they go? Well, that was discovered in our history fairly recently. They're going to the transvolcanic range in central Mexico. I went there a couple of years ago. I've got some photo blog pictures that are coming up. So I'm sorry that I'm gonna bore you with some, some travel news. But this transvolcanic range is 10,000 feet above sea level. The monarchs are up in these high mountains. Again, they're up in the clouds. That's the way that they stay hydrated. It's cold enough for them to be dormant, but not freeze. And that's why they're not going to our southern states because they're not reproductive 12 months of the year. Um, you know, how they find their way to Mexico is still a mystery. But in this transvolcanic range, there are multiple sanctuaries. There's four of them that are open to the public and each is a little bit different in the accessibility and of course the difficulty of the hike to get up into those mountains and so on. So I don't know if all of you or any of you know Linda, the gardener at the Botanical Gardens, but she and I went on this adventure back in 2019 and I would do it again in a heartbeat and take anybody that wants to go with me. So what you do, is you have to ride by horseback. Again, it's 10,000 feet above sea level. There is no way. <laughs> I'm sure there are avid young people who are hikers that can make it, but not me. So you go by horseback, you ride about an hour and a half. And um, whoop, let me go back. You ride about an hour and a half up the mountain till the horses can't go any further and you get off and then you hike. So I'm gonna show you a couple of those pictures in a minute. Anyway. The monarchs generally begin to arrive at these sanctuaries in the central mountains of Mexico around the day of the dead. Now I've been given two different dates. So at some point someone will correct me, but I've been told that that coincides with our Halloween. So October 31st, but then someone else said that it's actually er some a date early in November. Um, at the base of these mountains, these butterflies are flying through the, the cemeteries and for probably hundreds of years, the native population of those regions um, attributed those monarchs coming back as the spirits of their ancestors. So they decorate the um, cemeteries with flowers, which is a fabulous thing because all of those monarchs that are gonna hunker down for the winter get to nectar on those flowers before they go up into the mountains. All right, so this is a view of the hiking path, but what I wanted to point out is that in the, in the past, these forests and sanctuaries were, have suffered a lot of illegal logging. And it's, it's for two reasons. At one point in time, um, we're going back, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, the populations in these mountains felt that they were being, it was a plague coming through. There were millions and millions of monarchs and they were cutting down the trees so that the plague of, of this infestation would go away. Obviously they have learned since then that that is not what's going on, but the, the continuation of um, some of this illegal logging is for, uh, for income uh, and families are still using wood burning stoves to cook and heat their homes. So they need to have lumber, wood to, to do that and they're just cutting down trees in the forest, not necessarily the ones that the monarchs are on, but if they're cutting trees around that area, they are changing the influence and the structure of that forest and that microclimate would be, will begin to change. So um, with the tourism industry, a lot of those native people that live in those mountainous regions are um, making income from things like tree nurseries, and being guides within the sanctuary. We did stay at one little village uh, in Machero, which is in the, the country, no, excuse me, the state of Michoacan in the country of Mexico. Um, and that whole town has bought into, they're at the foot of the Sierra Pallone uh, entrance to the sanctuary. And that whole town has bought into 
the tourism. So they have a little cottage industry where you can go and visit the lady who weaves the baskets. And the lady who weaves the baskets trades for everything that she needs. And you know, then you have the lady that raises the chickens and the, the, the farm that raises the fish. So there's this whole industry where the village is trading with each other um, to be able to buy wood from the next mountain over. So by visiting these sanctuaries, you're helping raise awareness and employ those who, the, who are protecting them. Okay, on horseback and you're looking out over the mountain, that's what you see. Um, this whole transvolcanic range. It is extremely difficult to breathe. I thought I was ready for this trip and, and didn't take long to discover that all that exercise that I thought I was doing here at ground level or at sea level in Virginia Beach it didn't help me a bit. My muscles were great, my lungs were not. Okay, so this is the hike up the mountain in Sarah Pallone. This is where Dr. Fred, and I, I don't, I'm not positive of the pronunciation, I think it's Urquhart. In 1976, he first confirmed that the butterflies that were coming from North America and Canada were finding their way to these Oyamil fir forests in central Mexico. There is a video that I'm going to, I have got it on one of their last screens for you to take down. I watched it last night just to confirm that it's still there. It's called Flight of the Butterflies. If you have the opportunity to watch it, please copy that website down when we get there. But that's the hike up the mountain after you've ridden your horse for about an hour and a half. And there we are, not breathing. So as you go up the mountain, the monarchs You'll just fi first find just a few, but as you go up in elevation, I'm just going to click through these pictures really quickly and then get back to the migration story. Um, you first see a few, and then the clusters start to get bigger. And then you start seeing things like this, where it, it actually takes you, not only does the mountain take your breath away, but it's like going to a cathedral. It just is like, I, I don't even know what to say about it. Um, you can hear everybody's really quiet and you just hear this rustling, like paper rustling constantly because the butterflies are in motion. They're, they're hunkering down. This was in January and it was a warm day. And if it's warm enough, they will, um, they'll, they'll, come, they'll, they'll come out and they'll hydrate, whether it's through nectar or going to puddles. They weren't doing that on this particular day, but there was still a lot of movement going on. And that's what you get to see, just millions, millions and millions. And actually you look in the trees, when we first got there, we were looking in the trees and you don't realize that that's what they are, but all of these are just clusters and clusters. And because their wings are closed, they had this gray appearance and you just thought that it was sort of these, that kind of moss that grows from trees until you discover that, oh no, that's, that's all the millions of monarchs. So that's what you get to see. Okay, I believe that's my last shot of that. And then, and then when they're in motion, here you go. I mean, you just can't imagine. Okay, so how do they get where they're going? Well, we know geographically how they get to Mexico but we don't know their biological behavior in getting there. There's, um, there's lots of studies going on, their flight patterns, their navigation, what is it that's driving them to those particular places? Because remember, it's five generations later, no butterfly that's going there at the end of the season has ever been there before. It was their great, 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 possibly even great, great grandparents that were there the previous year. There's somewhere between, depending on where you are in the country, three to five generations of monarchs. And this information about this migration is passed on through those generations. Absolutely amazing, don't have the answer for it. But because of tagging, which began with Dr. Fred Urquhart, that's how he began to figure out where all these North American monarchs were going, he started a tagging program, which is part of that video that I'm encouraging you to go watch. Um, and it still continues with Monarch Watch. And the Botanical Garden does 
tag monarchs as part of the citizen scientist contribution to these studies that are happening through monarchwatch.org um, on an annual basis. And there, it gives them data points. So as an example, any butterfly that is east of the Appalachian mountain range through the tagging program they have learned is never found having crossed over the mountain range. If they're leaving any of these Eastern states, they're going down the Eastern, not on the seaboard, they're actually hovering and gliding or taking the air current thermals to help drive them in an efficient way south. And when they get down into Georgia, the majority of them, lost my pointer, the majority of them will make a right turn and go across the Gulf states. There are times when the, the air currents are more favorable for them to go across the Gulf waters. And if you've ever Googled some of the pictures, some of the oil rigs out here, they I don't know what color they are during the day, let's say they're green, but then at night they're totally orange because they are so covered with monarchs that are roosting for the night. Butterfly, the monarch butterflies or any butterfly for that matter, cannot fly at night because they lose their body temperature. Um, so back to the migration route. They're going down, a few of them will miss the turn and they'll end up down in Southern Florida. There is a 12 month of the year colony down in Miami, but there's a lot of concern about them because they're not healthy in that because they're reproductive 12 months of the year, all of those potential diseases uh, are never eradicated. In the migration pattern, the butterflies that are carrying any diseases, they just don't get there and they don't get to be reproductive the following spring, therefore the diminishing of the disease happens. So East Coast or East Coast butterflies are going south along the Appala uh, Appalachian mountain range. If they're in the central part of the country, there's this funneling effect where they're coming down and at some point, in South Texas, they're all gathering and going down into that central uh, transvolcanic range in Mexico. Our West Coast monarchs are behaving differently. Again, you don't have anything, any monarchs of either Eastern or Western crossing over the, um, the Rockies. So everything from Washington and Oregon is coming down and there's a number of places on the California coast um, Pacific Grove being one of them where they can, they have that microclimate available. So there's no necessity for them to travel down into Mexico, although some of them do, um, but they don't have to because they have these other roosting spots that will carry them through the winter. So how they get there, we know because of the tagging program, but how they get there in their navigation system is still a mystery. So here's a butterfly that is tagged. Um, when we tag a monarch, what they're looking for is the number. It's always, this year it's four, but in the past it's been three letters, three numbers. It has a website and a uh, 800 telephone number. So the hope is that if a person finds a tagged monarch, they live or dead, that they will report it and it gives a data point. So here's some of the things that have been learned over the years. When we, we talked about the route, but in using that route, we do know that they can travel somewhere between, I don't know, 80 to 100 miles on a given day if the weather conditions are right, because the data point would be, we've tagged a monarch here at the Norfolk Botanical Garden at this date, time, and place. And if it's found 24 hours later, somewhere in you know the border of South Carolina, th th there's information then that says, okay, the weather conditions were right for this butterfly to get that far on a given day. The normal, normal expected forward progression is about 25 miles a day. So again, they have to be a super generation because they have to live a whole lot longer to get to where they're going and then, and then sustain themselves through the winter months. Okay, so what happens when they arrive? Well, we've kind of covered that. So I threw this one last picture in to say what they're going to do is they're going to they're going to find their place in the forest, um, latch onto the branch of the tree, and then they enter a phase called diapause. So I'm going to talk about some of our native butterflies at, at this moment and say we've already kind of talked about how our native species have a um, 
a body, a chemical to keep them from freezing. All butterflies right now are being cued that the season is changing. The sun's getting lower in the sky, the nights are getting longer, and the days are getting cooler. That's the caterpillar cue. Our native species are going to finish feeding, assuming that the frost doesn't kill off their plant first. But if they're able to finish that cycle of feeding and shedding that fifth and final time, they're going to create a chrysalis and they're going to stay right there for the entire winter. They enter a phase called diapause. They're pausing their metabolic processes and simply hunkering down. So when you see an April butterfly, it's not coming back. It's been there. It's been somewhere in your neighborhood, maybe even your own backyard for the entire winter. It managed to evade any predation and weather conditions. And that's how you get a new generation of butterflies year after year. The monarch, there's, what's happening is just a tad bit different. The caterpillar is still getting that, that caterpillar cue, but it, their cue is to say, finish feeding, create a chrysalis, transform into a butterfly, and be behaviorally as well as biologically different. By behaviorally different, when I emerge as a butterfly, I am not going to court, I'm not gonna worry about reproduction. I have got to get to that survival zone and off I go. Um, we do know that when they are in transit, they are flying anywhere, depending on the thermals, where the air current is most efficient for them. It could be ground level on up to about 10,000 feet. The average place that they're going to be is somewhere around 5,000 feet, about a mile high. And the reason for that is that just, just the way that the air currents are flowing, they're, um, they're able to hang glide and they're conserving energy. So they get to flap their wings twice and go a mile and flap again and let the wind carry them as opposed to actually fighting the winds and flying the entire way. It obviously saves energy, but it keeps them um, from deteriorating and able to support themselves over the course of the winter with their own body fat. They do nectar, they'll come down to ground and fuel because they have to put on body fat and lipids that they are going to sustain themselves so that we're in the forest in these trees, that's what they're living off of. So now how do they get back to us? Well, because they've moved so much closer to the equator, somewhere in late February, they are beginning to stir. They will feed, um, there's lots of meadows up in those mountains little plateaus, and I was surprised to see the wild, wild fields of flowers. Those of you that come to the botanical garden quite often, you've seen the, the meadow with all of the zinnias. These meadows look like that, but they're the native wildflowers of the region. Um, just pretty amazing. It was really funny because with Linda being with us, we're all looking up and she was looking down. It was, she was constantly checking out the plants and then, um, we got to, to where the butterflies were and actually had to say, Linda, look up, look up. It was really fun. But anyway, coming back, they're leaving Mexico late February, early March. And that, that generation that survived the winter, they go no further than the Mexico-Texas border. They're looking for the first milkweed available to them and that's where they're laying their eggs. They don't live much longer than that and they're not going any further than that. Remember with the life cycle, we talked about how it takes somewhere, let's call it 30 days for an egg to become a flying butterfly. So if, they're, if the egg was laid on March 1st, by April 1st, you have this whole first generation of monarch butterflies here in this region. And at that point, it's getting hot, dry, and the landscape is no longer lush. So you end up with this northward movement and what they're doing is just simply following the egg laying plant, which is milkweed. Um, for us to get monarchs back in Virginia, this is the spring range, I'm sorry. The spring range, the first generation, those children of those overwintering monarchs generally fall in this pattern of space down here. We not normally would see the first generation they're laying eggs, the children of the monarchs, wintering monarchs are laying eggs in this space in here. And so that's, they've developed from all of the month of um, March, let's say, all of these eggs that are laid here are developing the month of April. 
And by the time that grandchild gets up to us in Virginia, it's early, late April, early May is when we generally see monarchs coming into our zone. Um, and then from there, there's reproduction in this whole range here on up into Canada. And we might have as many as four, possibly five generations over the course of, of our summer until the time clock comes in back into full circle and it's time for them to turn around as the fifth generation and go the other direction. So it's multiple generations coming back to us and one generation that makes that journey south. So this is a review. I like this chart um, because it breaks it down in a real simple. So I'm gonna start here because right now in Canada, the migration started mid August. For us here in Virginia, the migration window opens about mid-September. I usually say September 20th when somebody asks me, but I will be honest in saying there's nothing hard and fast about that day. There's usually, I'd say, an easy five days to either side of it where that caterpillar might have gotten the memo or might not. So somewhere around October 20th, let's say if that was hard and fast, if I became a butterfly before that date, I'm going to remain um, reproductive and I am never gonna wake up one morning and say, my goodness, look at the time, got to go. It's the caterpillar that becomes a butterfly after September 20th that will be the migrator. And obviously that butterfly that was, let's call it born, hat, and hatch is not the right word. They, they don't hatch from their chrysalis, they either emerge or they eclose. So when that butterfly emerges in, uh, let's say September 15th, and it's reproductive, the next two to three weeks of its life, it's laying eggs and those eggs are going to develop. And yes, there are butterflies that, that are emerging late November, and they're going to be the ones that are gonna make every effort to get to the breeding, uh, the overwintering grounds. So that leads me to say that what happens, there is a, uh, it's called a prime window. So for Virginia, mid-September through, let's call it 30 days, mid-October. If the butterfly is leaving in that window of time, their odds of getting to the wintering, overwintering grounds and successfully remaining alive is exponentially increased. Anything after that date, that butterfly that's leaving from that point and beyond, it decreases for three specific reasons. The days are shorter, therefore the flight time per day diminishes. It takes them way longer to get there. The resources for nectaring and putting on body fat are also decreased because many of the flowers that they would nectar from have simply gone past their prime. They're, they're, they're dying off just naturally um, or frost has taken them. And the third, contributing factor is that when they get into Mexico, those prime locations where it's more conducive to be protected are already taken. They become the outer edges of the population. So at the first bad weather day, they're exposed, they don't have the body fat and they are really tired. So the window of opportunity of becoming a butterfly between mid-September and mid-October and getting there and surviving is, they're the ones that we expect will be there to be reproductive the following spring. So let's jump ahead. They get to where they're going between October and November. Um, they're, they're in this state of dormancy called diapause through February. At that point, they're they arouse, and again, we talk about March is the uh, breeding season begins. They lay their eggs at that Texas-Mexico border, first generation in April, next generation May 3rd, 4th, and the circle just goes right on around. Okay, so what can you do? All right, to help support this, you know, obviously we're, we, we can't do too much as an individual about the microclimates in Mexico. There are groups and organizations that you can support that are doing all that they can to make sure that those forests remain intact um, and that the education to the general public as to why and what we might be able to do um, you know, as general citizens, but we're certainly not gonna go out there and hug a tree and, and keep somebody from chopping it down. So 
locally by creating a monarch waste station. It's simply adding milkweed and nectar sources to either existing gardens, creating gardens, or maintaining natural habitats where milkweed just normally grows. That's what we can do to continue to support the, that there's an abundance of monarchs to attempt the journey and um, just to, to sustain the uh, population. All right, so the value of a monarch station is, is a lot of what I just referred to. Creating one is you're helping contribute to the con conservation, but it's also assuring the preservation of the species and continuing that um, spectacular migration. So this is a picture from three, the, oh, okay, we went to three reserves and I didn't mention that. We went to El Rosario, uh, Sierra Chincon, which I, again, don't speak Spanish, so I apologize for the pronunciation, and Sarah Pallone. Those were the three that we visited in the week that we were there. Okay, so monarch way stations are places that provide resources necessary for monarchs to produce successive generations so that we can sustain this migration. So what we're talking about in, again, milkweed, milkweed, and more milkweed. There's over a hundred varieties of milkweed in the world. There are four that grow exceptionally well here in Virginia. Um, so depending on how you choose to garden, what your garden space is like, and the behavior of the plant is how you might elect which one works best for you. This is a picture of uh, common milkweed. It's also referred to as Syriaca. Monarch butterflies will generally lay the eggs on the underside of the leaves of any of the kinds of milkweed. Um, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you'll find them on the stem or on the top of the leaf. But more often than not, they will be to the underside. So these are the four milkweeds that we will encourage those of you that live in Virginia to uh, consider incorporating into your garden. Uh, three of them are perennial. So you have incarnata. You'll find it called swamp milkweed. What that tells you is they like wet feet. They're going to do well in our, our clay that holds a lot of water. Um, Tuberosa but is referred to as butterfly weed. It grows low and shrubby and it will tolerate dry sandy soil. So you'll find this more in our region in the, in the oceanfront area where, where the soil is, is really loose and sandy. Um, then you have again that Syriaca, the common milkweed. This is one that tends to be controversial, controversial um, tropical milkweed. It's referred to as Carvasica, and it's the one that you find more often than not in your garden centers. It comes up by the trunk loads from our southern states. It's easy to grow. It gives you a lot of plant, um, but there's been a lot of controversy about it that says, you know, it might be changing the behavior of the monarchs. All right, here's my theory. I don't buy into that, and I will tell, I'll explain why. It gives you a lot of plant, and it will, will um, re, reflush multiple times over the course of the season. The problem with it is it, it, it will flourish long after our three Virginia natives have depleted. Right now, the common milkweed is virtually gone. It's yellowed, it's done. I've looked at a number of places where swamp milkweed grows. It's nothing but sticks. So. The controversy has always been, well, if it's maybe the monarchs are going to change their behavior because there's a plant that they can still lay eggs on and therefore they're not going to migrate. Well, that's not the case. They're either migratory or they're not. Having the plant in front of a, butter, a monarch butterfly that's programmed to migrate is not going to stop them. What I, what I have personally seen happening is that you have butterflies that are not migratory who are um, still looking to lay the eggs. Now, again, you cross that threshold that says, well, but they're not likely to make it to Mexico anyway. So why do you encourage those that are still laying to continue to lay? Well, because that's their behavior. They're looking for a plant to lay their eggs on and maybe some of them will get to Mexico. So let me give them the plant. Um, but I've also seen butterflies that are not migratory. They're moving south because where they are, there is no more milkweed. And they're looking for milkweed to lay eggs on. And there is southward movement, but they're not part of the migratory 
pack, if you will. Um, the other reason that tropical milkweed is controversial is that in the South where it does grow 12 months of the year, it is a harborer of a butterfly disease. But here our tropical milkweed is going to die off and it's not going to come back because it functions as an annual here. And that, that disease that it might be carrying is going to disappear. And when you get a new plant next year, it's fresh, it's clean, and we're not perpetuating the disease. Down in places like Miami that I mentioned really early in this conversation, um, the, the, the diseases down there has everything to do with the fact that the milkweed never goes away and there's never this self-cleansing that goes on. So that's my stand on tropical milkweed. Um, there are other the theories out there and other opinions out there, but um, I've been using it for a long time. And if you, if you, at the end of the season, let it die, you're okay. Okay. The other thing you want to do in your gardens is have nectar flowers for the fall migration because without it, they're not going to put on the body fat to be able to get to Mexico and be able to sustain themselves. So the need for host and larva plants as an energy source applies to all monarchs, but it applies to all butterflies anywhere in the world. So no effort by, on your part is too small to have an impact. Um, people visit us here at the Botanical Gardens at the Butterfly House and, you know, I wish I could have a garden like this, but I live in an apartment. Well, here you go. Put a pot on your patio, offer some nectar sources. If you feel like you can um, support them with, uh, um, there is no milkweed plant in this picture, but if you had a milkweed in a pot and you're going to raise 10, 12 caterpillars off of it, well, more power to you. You know, you can create a habitat in nothing more than a flower pot if you're willing to give it a dry and water it more frequently than it is if it has to be in the ground. <coughs> I'm sorry, I need a sip, excuse me, for a moment. All right, so guidelines for creating a Monarch Way Station are pretty simple. Monarch Watch established this program a number of years ago. And basically what they did is they created a registry um, quite honestly, it was a means for them. You have to pay to register your site, um, but it was a means for them to establish a fund so that they could pay people in Mexico to do a number of things. One, not log the trees. Two, look for tags so that we could continue the, the, the science research on this whole migration pattern. So by creating a um, monarch way station and then registering it, you're doing, you're, you're contributing to a, an organization that is doing everything they can to protect the flyways, both north and south, as well as um, protecting the sanctuaries in Mexico. So if you were to register and you choose to have this sign, that's what you can put in your garden. So here's a couple of things about the guidelines for a way station. Um, a way station can actually be a habitat that's integrated into an existing garden. There's no minimum area requirement, but the encouragement is to try and have a way station at least 100 square feet, 10 by 10. Um, the total area can be split up among several sites, so it doesn't have to be all at one continuous location. And here's a couple of examples of things you might have in your way station, obviously milkweed and nectar sources. Um, we are not in the flyway. We are not part of the north, the, from the north to the south migration route because we're too close to the coastline, but we are supporting the monarchs that are locally bred. Um, in the flyway, again, they're gonna, anything that's coming from the north of us has already moved into like Charlottesville and they're hovering along that, um, the Appalachian mountain range and catching the thermals from those Northern cut states down. But locally, the butterflies that are being bred and, and feeding and developing here still need nectar and, and milkweed resources. And then they're going to go West and South to get to where they're going. If you choose to create a habitat, um, usually the plants that you're going to want to put in your garden are gonna need a lot of sun. So, the, it would be good to elect a place in your yard that, or, or wherever you're choosing to put this garden with at least six hours of sun a day. 
Um, butterflies need shelter for a number of reasons. Some is to uh, keep hidden from predators, um, but others is also protect them from elements. Obviously, if you have a rain day, they need to be hunkered down and, and kind of you know looking for those big plants that are going to give them an umbrella. All right, so back to the milkweed plants. Maximize the use of your habitat. The recommendation is that you have a minimum of 10 milkweed plants. And if you can uh, put different species in, that's even better because they mature and flower at different times. So in this little garden right here, which you know basically you're 10 by 10, you have all of these common milkweed plants, no flowers yet, but then you have your swamp milkweed back in here that's blooming. And then up front here, you have your tuberosa. So within this garden space, by the time some of these flowers are going to die off, um, these will be in bloom. These are going to get, can get as much as 10 feet tall. This is going to stay low and shrubby to the ground. And your swamp milkweed is going to be a little bit more wispy and willowy. Um, swamp milkweed comes in two colors. Uh, pink and white. Tuberosa is always this orange, and this is always a, a, a lavender ball that's kind of a, looks a lot like fragrant and looks a lot like a um, hydrangea, if you will. So the more varieties you can put in, the better. The more plants you can put in, the better. But I will say to you, I'll, I'm going to qualify that by saying, no matter how many plants you put in, it's never enough. Because the more plants you have, the more butterflies will use your garden space, the more eggs and caterpillars you'll have, and you'll still run out of milkweed. So there's never, ever enough unless you find yourself in a place where you can have an acre of it. And then you might be okay to get through the season. All right. So nectar plants, obviously all butterflies need them. Um, nectar source that blooms sequentially or continuously during the season. Again, how you choose to garden would be either, uh, for example, if you put in perennials, a perennial generally has a very specific seasonal bloom. So in that one footprint, you might have to have three plants, your spring, your summer, and your fall bloom, where if you choose to use annuals, unfortunately, then you have an annual expense in purchasing them. But generally, your annuals are going to give you a, a flower from early spring until fall. So that's what we're talking about down here in this last line. Annual, biennial, perennial plants that provide all season long. So here's a couple of um, examples. Butterflies prefer to have flowers that are, I call them the landing pad, where they land once and they have multiple ports where they can dip their proboscis in and nectar from. So lantana is a good landing pad. Uh, penta, obviously butterfly bush. Zinnias are deceiving. You don't think that there's multiple parts, but all of these are tiny little flowers that are producing nectar in each one. And so is your um, Black Eyed Susan. Then you have in the fall bloom, things like asters and goldenrod. So that would fall into your perennial cat category. Um, in electing your plants, here's some management concerns. Obviously, how much time do you have and how much are you willing to put into it? So things like mulching, thinning, fertilizing, amending the soil, removing dead stalks, watering, eliminating insecticide use, and removing other invasive species. All of that takes time and energy. So plan your garden according to how much you're willing to give it. All right. If you choose to have a habitat and you choose to have um, it registered at Monarch Watch, uh, you, you'll always get this certificate with how, what number way station you are. And then again, this sign is something that you could purchase in addition to this paper certificate that you'll get. Whoops, went to one too many. So I wanted to point out, as of August 4th, there was th over 35,000 Monarch way stations um, around the world. Mine is number 341. So I have been at this for a really long time. Probably longer than I should be telling you. But here's an example of a couple of way stations. You can see there's lots of milkweed here. So this is that movie that I um, mentioned earlier. It's actually a documentary that talks about Fred Urquhart, how he found those butterflies in Mexico from 
Canada. Um, if you can, if you have time, it's 40 minutes long. I'm going to put this up at the end of our talk and leave this up when we're answering questions so that you can um, copy it down, uh, whether you screenshot or get a paper and pencil ready, but go to Documentary Mania and then search for Flight of the Butterflies. These next few slides I threw in because people ask me this all the time. This is what my house looks like during breeding season. I'm raising butterflies for the botanical garden and I have seven racks like this and there can be as few or as many, um, depending on the species, as few as 10 and as many as 25 caterpillars in each of these boxes. So if I'm working with 10 because of the kind of food, the amount of food they eat and how quickly they consume it, that's 250 caterpillars on each rack. If I'm putting more than that each in each one, obviously you see the multiple applying factor. This is my dining room table. We never eat at it during the summer because these are the tiny little caterpillars that eventually will be moved into bigger boxes and fed. At the end of the season, we are in the past and we've not done it this year because um, of some COVID restrictions, but normally, and hopefully it will happen next year, the Botanical Garden, we do a tag and release event the effort and the goal has always been to tag 100 monarchs every hour for six hours of the day and send 600 monarchs off as part of that citizen scientist um, contribution. So this is what it looks like during that period of time. These are the chrysalis that I harvest that week so that we can um, have them emerge and have the number of butterflies. And this is a rack of chrysalis the the week of the day of um, leading up to that tagging event. Um, as you can see here uh, for tracking purposes for 80, 560, I start pinning them at the bottom and work my way up every day as they um, pupate. And up here we're at 640. So I don't know, that probably took me to 700 something up in this on this level, but that's part of what I do to, to make that event come together. So, Hopefully we all can do something for monarchs. I know you probably have lots more questions about the migration. I kind of deviated from it, but I certainly, we can come back to it with your questions. Um, so if you have any, make sure that you post them to the, to the chat room and Diana will talk about it. And these are three of the um, sites. And I'm gonna leave this up while we're talking further. Again, we're going back to that uh, documentary. Monarch Watch is the tagging program. Monarch Watch studies the um, migration, primarily the migration from north to south. And Journey North is focused on the returning populations. And those of us that are raising monarchs or observing them can report to both of these organizations what you see and when, and it helps them with their the study and the science and figuring out some of the other things that are going on with monarchs. So I'm going to leave this screen up. It's the last screen that I'm going to talk to or about, and we can jump over to your questions. So I, well, maybe I can't. Can, can, Diana, can you talk to me from here or do I need to go back to? Yeah, you can, you can talk. Okay. Okay. So you can tell if it, has any, anybody posted any questions? 